Brilliant. Um, well, I uh, just wanted to say welcome everybody and thank you for attending um, on behalf of City and Guilds. Um, and thank you to our speakers before they've even started um, for your time today. Um, we really appreciate your support. Um, I just wanted to briefly kick off um, and talk about today and what our discussion will be around. And it, as the title says, it will be around the future of the construction industry and where we see um, the concerns regarding recruitment and sort of sector skills and shortages and obviously where we see this going um, forward and what those issues are likely to be with the thought of green skills, um, the ageing workforce and obviously new qualifications coming through. So um, yes, it just leads me on now to introduce um, our first piece, which is, um, we're, I'm sorry, I'm going to run through the agenda just briefly. So we're going to have um, an insight from ourselves will be a ready for construction video, which supports the work we're currently doing uh, in the sector to get to improve the skills shortage. Um, and then we will lead on to our panel of guest speakers, Andy Trainer from Tra Travis Perkins, who will give us an employer view on recruitment and skills and the challenges faced within the sector. And also Jenny LaRock from Ingius, um, working in partnership with employers and city and guilds to help us provide the solutions. We'll then go on to some breakouts into virtual rooms um, to look at some strategies and discuss um, how the industry can attract and nurture new talent. And then we'll come back with our feedback from these sessions um, and hopefully we'll be on time to close at 11.45. So yeah, thank you. And of course that's me, sorry, I didn't even introduce myself. <laughs> I'm so keen to get run through all of this. Um, yeah, sorry, my name is Naz Lewis Humphrey. Some of you may know me, I'm the industry manager here at City and Guilds for construction. Thanks, Naz. Um, I'm Joe Bell. I'm um, the Adult Skills Manager for City and Guilds. Um, we've got um, Gemma as well that you might know, so we just introduce the City and Guilds people probably. Um, we've been working a lot with um, construction employers um, and employability organisations um, such as Ingius to really think about what the challenges um, facing the market are. Some of the people on the call today, including our panellist Andy from Travis Perkins, have been helping us to develop um, a new course um, to complement you know, all the many construction qualifications that you may, may be already familiar with called Ready for Construction. There is a promo video on YouTube um, and the link's there and we'll share it afterwards. We're not going to play it in the, um, in the session today, it's just 30 seconds. But essentially, we've just been working with employers to attract new talent to the sector and maybe bust some of the myths about working in the sector, um, try and um, emphasise the opportunities within the construction sector. And that's the, the wider sector, including, obviously, supply chain and um, the more administrative roles within there. So um, after the session, we'll send, we'll send this out. It's certainly something to look out for. Hopefully, you will see people coming to you, applying for jobs within your organisation, carrying um, a badge to show that they have done the course <laughs> alongside the more familiar CSCS and kind of apprenticeships and all the all the usual stuff that you see. So just watch this space for Ready for Construction. We'd be really interested to hear what you think about it um, in some of the breakout groups later. Um, but it's time to hear more from um, our panellists. So if we go into the next session, please. Okay, um, so I'd like, to, as I said earlier, to introduce our two panellists, uh, Andy Rayner, Head of Apprenticeships and Early Careers at Travis Perkins, and Jenny LaRock, Head of Employee Services for Central uh, and West London in, in GIS, um, UK Limited. Um, I'd like to initially kick off um, with Andy, if that's okay. Um, we've got a couple of questions for you, Andy, if that's all right. Um, I just wondered, Andy, would it, can you give us um, your perspective on the key recruitment and skills challenges faced by the construction industry, industry both now and obviously in the future? Yeah, thanks, Naz. That's, um, yeah, and, and, and thanks, for, uh, thanks for inviting me to speak. 
And I've seen, I probably should introduce myself a little bit, but actually the easiest way to introduce myself is to say that I'm pretty typical of the sector. So, so, and I think that's half the reason I do the job that I do. So I've been involved with construction since the age of 16. I didn't get much of an education, if the truth be known. I kind of, you know, learned things as I, as I went along. And um, I worked for the same company for the last 30 years, that company being Travis Perkins. And, and, and you know, and I'm, I'm getting on a bit. And I'm, I'm white and I'm male and middle-aged and all that sort of stuff that goes with it. But pretty representative of the sector and been through experience a lot of people working in the sector that they have been in. And, and, and those are the challenges that we, we now face. So, so we, we're now starting to kind of think, well, you know, how do we need to change what we do as a, as a, as a sector, as an organisation? And really that's driven by two things. So I think that to answer the question, Mass, there's two, there's two key challenges, and, and I'm sure most people on the call are well aware of this. The first one is around this, this need to modernise the, the, the way that we build in the UK. Um, and, and yeah, we have, you know, we changed our building techniques gradually over the years, but fundamentally what I learned as an apprentice at the age of 18 when I did my apprenticeship, but as an apprentice at the age of 18, isn't that different to what we learned for site work today? So, so, so things haven't moved on dramatically. There's a lot more safety, there's a lot more regulation, there's a lot more other stuff going on, but fundamentally the trades are, are, are very similar to what they've always been. And, and, and yet, if we look at that construction sector, you know, the, the, the reality is that, that nearly 40% of carbon production comes from, comes from the built environment. Uh, you know, we, 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 we're going to have to change the way we build. There's, there's not choice and option of that. If we don't change the way, it'll be legislated to change the way that we build. And then coupled with that, you kind of got this, this onslaught of digital and data and different ways of doing things. You know, so, so you know, we, we, we talk data an awful lot in the business. You know, we've got our own algorithms. Don't even really know what an algorithm is, let alone what that kind of data stuff is. You know, digital use is is is, is massive. I'm I'm just impressed. That I'm talking on a Zoom call and it hasn't gone wrong yet because that's usually what happens when I when I come onto it. And, and and you know that that kind of that need to take carbon out of the out of the built environment and and to utilise our opportunities to to use data, to use digital technology, um, to, to to change the way that we do things is it, forefront for everybody. The, the, the reality is that, is, you know, that, that, that me and my generation probably aren't going to be the people who are going to, going to solve that challenge. You know, I'm, 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 I'll put my hands up. I'm scared of, of, of digital. I don't understand data. I've tried. I've been in this role for five years. I was a operational director with the business where I started looking at apprenticeships and how we train young people. But partly because of that realisation that, that, that my generation isn't necessarily going to come up with the right solutions and the right ways of working. And, and yeah, we can make a difference and we can, we can move things forward. There's no question about that, but we're going to need to bring in a more diverse population into the construction sector, people with different thoughts, different ideas, different passions, different values, if we really want to move construction construction forward. And like I say, I don't think it's a choice thing. I don't think it's a thing we get to make decisions on. You know, for, for me, you know, the, 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 you know, the removal of carbon out of construction, the, the, the change of views and the way that we build things means that we have to change. It's not a choice. So how are we going to do that? We need people to help us work out how to do that. So that's almost the first challenge, and it's a bloody big challenge. So, so we've got to get heads around how do you modernise construction in the UK? And, and then the second challenge which sits, um, you know, it, and, and in some ways it is kind of very connected, and, and the answer to, 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 to both of them are probably very similar. But, but that's this, this kind of emerging skills shortage and, and, and skills crisis that we're seeing. So it was there before COVID. So, so you know, we all we all knew, knew it existed before COVID, but... Um, but we, you know, in fact, it's been grown since 2008, really, since the banking crisis. But, but we haven't done a great deal to, um, to, to address it. And, and, and you know, the, the chickens are coming home at a roost to a degree. Uh, you know, within Travis Perkins, my business, we employ three and a half thousand HGV drivers. Now, now we, 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 we've got past the, the bubble that, that kind of burst a little while ago and we're OK. But, but you know, you go flipping out. Our average age of our HGV drivers is 56. You know, so where are our next population of HGV drivers coming from? And we're finding that, that we're not got young people in the education settings going, hey, I want to drive a lorry for a builder's merchant. It's not, it's, you know, it's not a career choice that's there. The, 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 the mass varies. You can read the CITB reports or various different reports, CLC stuff. You know, the, the, the fundamentals are we probably need about 50,000 people joining the sector. We're probably getting about 30,000 a year. So, so the numbers joining the sector are definitely dropping off. The, the levies caused all sorts of headaches around apprenticeships. So... So we're in that world that, that we needed, you know, the levy was put there and the apprenticeship reforms back in 2016 were about growing apprentices. But in effect, we're seeing a decrease in apprenticeships, although it's starting to starting to pull back. Um, but there's clearly some need to do in that. The, the, the subcontracting model doesn't doesn't help, you know, that bringing apprenticeships into the business. You know, we, 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 we've got we've got our 600,000 SME customers, you know, that, that, that just confused the heck out of, out of levy and haven't got the energy or the, the, the time to really understand what, what that is and what that means. 
Um, so, so we kind of got this this challenge as a sector about how do we bring people in uh, through those routes. And then when we go and speak to young people, and we do quite a lot of outreach work with young people, yeah, you know, we know that, that actually nine out of ten young people haven't even considered a career in construction. It's not even on their list. Yeah, you know, they're in they're in educational settings where the teacher talks to about going to university. That's what your life's about. That's what you need to do. Level six, level seven, get yourself a get yourself a degree, and they might get a bit of a mention. Or you could do an apprenticeship, or you might want to do an apprenticeship at Rolls Royce or or, or Capita or, or KPMG or, or something fancy like that because they have the they have the influence to, to, to get into their schools and colleges. So so the reality is we've got very few young people who want to work in construction, high barriers to entry to get into construction, and we're simply not getting enough people coming through. And, and now, so those, those, are the, those are the challenges, you know, that they're, they're both bloody massive. How do you modernise construction within the UK? Fairly, fairly chunky thing to do. And at the same time, how do you make um, construction attractive to to young people and career changes because you know we, we, there's a lot of people coming out of retail sectors and hospitality sectors how can we make construction attractive to those people um, and to, to bring them in the, the, the answer the solution to all our problems lies in solving that kind of attraction issue if we can bring in a new generation of people if we can train them on the skills they need for modernizing construction then then, then we've got a shot at making this making this work oh definitely thank you um and you know what i would say and agree with that is about how as you said, how we communicate that out to young people and to people who are considering a career change or, you know, thinking about, you know, what the options are within construction and also what that future in construction is going to look like, as you said, you know, digitalization, uh, new green skills, um, you know, we're all talking about retrofit and what does that mean um, to the new learner and obviously to the individual wanting to come into the sector. Um, so thank you for that. The other question I really wanted to ask you as well is with regards to um, your insight on how Travis Perkins are trying to tackle these challenges at the moment. Yeah, so so we, we've um, we, we think we're making some 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 real headway. So if I talk about it a little bit, in fact, let me describe who Travis Perkins are. So I'm not sure everyone on the call will will know this. So so we're a supplier of building materials. We're actually the largest distributor of building materials in in the UK. I usually say we've got more branches than McDonald's. And we've got more lorries than Eddie Stowe Park because that kind of gets the message across. So, so, so we're, we're a big organisation. We've got multiple brands that that, that, that we work out. So, Travis Perkins, our main one, but Keyline, CCF, BSS, Benchmark. There's, there's a load of brands that sit underneath that, it's underneath the Travis Perkins umbrella that specialise to a degree in in, in, in what they do. Um, and we employ about twenty thousand colleagues. So, again, we're a large employer within the within the construction sector. And really importantly, we've got about six hundred thousand customers, um, majority of which are SME customers, some of which are, are, are large organisations. And, and the question we really started asking ourselves, in fact, before COVID, we, we started looking at this really around those, those two challenges that were, were emerging around modernisation and skill shortage, was how do we use that scale for good? So we're a big organisation, you know, we, 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 we employ a couple of thousand people every year, but how do we how do we use that scale for good? So yes, we had our own challenges about recruitment, you know, roles like HGV drivers, like kitchen designers were getting tougher and tougher to recruit. But actually we, we started to think, well, can we do something bigger than just, just us, which was a challenge. So we set up in 2016 as an employer provider for apprenticeships, that, that's gone, gone really well for us. We, 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 we spend our levy, so, so a lot of organisations out there don't, we actually spend more than our levy, so we get a bit of money extra off the government and contribute, self-contribute a bit towards that. Uh, we've got 40 odd programmes, got about a thousand people on programme at the moment, apprentices on programme, we've got a thousand that have graduated. And, and our apprentices are really a mixture of two things. So some of them are, are um, school leavers, you know, what you traditionally think of as an apprentice, somebody joining the sector at the educational settings. Um, but some are, some are career changes. And, and like I mentioned earlier, we've had some real success with bringing people from different sectors in. And I, and I appreciate, you know, it's slightly different within supply to what it is construction, that the barriers to entry are definitely lower. There's, there's no question about that. The complexity isn't, isn't as great. But we've had real success with, um, with bringing people into those roles. And we think we can help construction through that process as well. But, but the truth is we have, you know, we have, um, we have struggled to attract people. It's not always easy. So we started to think about pre-apprenticeship as a, a language we use a lot. So how do we get people interested? How do we hook into people? So we don't just kind of go, hey, we've got an apprenticeship, come and join us. We start talking to people about working within construction, you know, when they're in those educational settings, when they are starting to think working with the DWP and, and, and people like that. And that's been that's been really successful for us. So so we were big users of the Kickstart program. I'm sure many of you have seen that when it came along. So we're, we've included um, I think we're up to nearly 500 Kickstarters who have joined the business now, but 150 of them are in permanent employment with us. And our plan is to roll at least 70 percent of our Kickstarters into into permanent employment, which which we think works really well. 
Um, we, we, we've started a summer summer traineeship program, so we bring people in, you know, college students come and work for us over the summer months, introduce them to construction. We've had a few hundred do that that this um, this summer, and we, we tend to grow that as a program. You know, they want the they want the money, they're students, so they want to work in the summer to get that beer money. Or, or not sure it's not just useful beer, but but to get that money, and, and and we can bring them in, help our business out over the, over those months when we've got people on holiday, but also introduce them to customers, introduce them to the sector. We've had real success with that. Uh, and, and, and we're launching, so we're just about to uh, launch a scheme, a traineeship scheme. We haven't gone live with that. That starts in January. So, so, so we're, we're kind of starting to work on that that pre pre apprenticeship program, and we do an awful lot of work in schools and colleges now, and, and that's growing. That that we we do think through that route, we can start helping our customers. So we think there's an opportunity, especially to work with with the SME customers. What was really interesting with Kickstarter is we bought we bought in Kickstarters who were young people under the age of 25, who we probably wouldn't have recruited in normal circumstances. So because we, we tend to look for people who experience, you know, reflect the sector. So suddenly we're bringing in a new generation, a different perspective of person who we put into our branches. And our branch managers openly say, yeah, we'll recruit them. There's no agony job. They don't know what they're talking about. They know nothing about construction. They know nothing about our customers. Wouldn't begin with a job. But we bought them in because, because the Kickstart came enabled us to do that because of the way it worked. Um, but what was really interesting was actually when we brought them in, a lot of those Kickstarters weren't looking to work within supply, they were looking to work within construction. They just couldn't get the route in, they couldn't get the access to that. And we've had our first, I think we're up to about 10 now, who have joined us through Kickstart to work in supply, and they've gone on to work for our customers. And, and it's great for our customers, they get to know them, they come in their yards, they come in our branches, they chat to them, they get to know who they are, they go, actually, do I need someone good to come and work for me? You know, Sue that I met last week, or... or whoever I've met, you know, it should be great. Yeah, brilliant. So they have that conversation and they move. And we think there's some real opportunity in, in, in that kind of style of working about how do you get in supply with its low barriers to entry and then how do you move into the construction set? The supply could be a experience, work experience type of program, and then you move into, into jobs. But I think that I think the, the key thing that we've learned, and probably the most important thing, and I'll shut up talking after this, I promise, because I'm probably open the time and all the end. Um, but the key thing that I, I, I think we've learned is Actually, if we really want to make a difference, if we really want to be able to bring uh, young people and people from different backgrounds into the sector, we, we have to collaborate. We, we, we started going to schools and colleges and talking about, hey, TP are great, you should come work for us, we're a cranking little business, we, we do this, we do that, it's a fantastic place to work. Um, and and you know, we were getting people who were going, yes, we're interested, but then linking up with vacancies that were alive in that environment when people said they were interested, we just didn't have enough collateral to make it work. And we worked out, we did a bit of maths at one point, we worked out we had to speak to 3,000 people before we found one that was going to work for Travis Perkins. So it's, so it's a big investment for an organisation of our scale, even of our scale, to go and talk to thousands and thousands of people to get those people to work for the business. But actually, if you look at construction supply, so you just look at the supply side of construction that we're part of, one in 200 young people will come and work in supply. So while one, one in 3,000 works for Travis Perkins, one in 200 in supply. So actually, when we start talking as a supply sector, We've only got to go and talk to 200 people to find one. You look at construction, 16 of those young people, 16, sorry, 16 out of those 200 young people would work in construction. And suddenly it's a really worthwhile conversation to be having because we can talk about opportunities and jobs within construction. So we're very much in a mode mindset at the moment about how do we collaborate with other organisations within supply, within construction, to, to, to make construction attractive. We've recently um, uh, uh, become the, so we're going to become the um, early careers advisor and apprenticeship supplier to the Builders Motion Federation. So you see some of you may know BMF. So BMF got got um, 750 organisational members, got got 250,000 people. The middle are all the early careers programmes and all of the apprenticeship programmes for them. And we think that gives us a bigger voice. So we've got more opportunities, but we're really keen to actually stretch that voice further than just by into, into construction itself. And we've got loads of opportunities. You know, we, we work with a lot of charities, BIY, Future. Dot, lots of organisations we're into, but but we almost need that kind of scale to make it worthwhile. If not, the numbers become too small. So, so a big part of the reason why I'm on this call and why I love talking about this subject is actually together we can make a real difference. But individually, it's bloody hard. I think that's me, Naz. Naz, I think you're probably on the mute if you're talking. Sorry, I thought I'd press mute and I must have double pressed it. Um, thank you. That is so helpful and so insightful. Um, and I do know that the work that Travis Perkins have been doing, especially with regards to Kickstarter, has been really, really successful. Um, and I think it would be sort of really helpful for other employers, you know, if it 
they were able to sort of share that model, um, not just for Kickstart, but of all the work you're currently doing. And I think it's, you know, not everybody, as you could say, uh, is of that size can do all of the things that you've been doing, but they can do some of them. And actually some of them might work quite well for them. So um, really appreciate that. Thank you so much. Um, that now leads me on to Jenny. Um, Jenny, I understand you've got um, a couple of slides you wanted to yeah, um, okay. present. So if I let you take the floor, um, and then, as I said afterwards, I've, I've got a question or two for you. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. And thank you, um, Sitting Gills, for allowing me to speak. Um, Gemma, do you want to move on? OK, just a brief overview about INGIUS. Um, I've been working with INGIUS now for just under six months. However, I have been in the welfare to work industry for nearly about 14 years. Some of you may know the organisation Shore Trust, so that's where I'm originally from. So, you know, INGIUS, they're an Australian organisation. Their mission is to enable better lives. Um, they're part of this international human services. But what I'm going to concentrate on is the work that we do in the employability sector in London. Thank you. So one of the things I'm listening to Andy's, um, I listen to Andy's um, bit is that we have, we run three contracts, which is the restart, um, which is, as you know, is the, the government's response to those people who furloughed or lost their, lost their jobs during to the pandemic. We also um, run the program called JET, which is a similar thing. And we've got the Work and Health program, which supports those people with challenges into work. They come from a myriad of skills or no skills or backgrounds. And I think it's really important working with organisations, especially in construction, um, how we can upskill people into those type of roles and we're you know and it's about pre preparing these participants for you as an employer we've got the luxury because we're funded by the government we can do the training we can do the qualifications we're working well with the city and guilds in promoting these type of courses which are going to support the participant in a job ready um, position for organisations like yourself. And I've added the employer wellbeing on this as well, because don't forget that these people have been unemployed and it will have some effect on them being unemployed for such a long time. And it's important when they're getting back into the workplace that we provide that support to them in the workplace and maybe to your parties, to your own staff as well. Now, you know, I will say with the construction sector, and maybe it's one of the questions that you've, you're going to ask me, um, I think that where we have participants who family have come from the construction sector and they want to get into and they don't know the route way and, but there are some people who don't have, it's okay, you can move to the next page. Um, who don't have an awareness into the sector. This is where we can help them and I'm looking to you guys as well to support that. The business benefits about working with India as well, as well as supporting the participants that we have a team of analysts who can provide all sorts of insights into different kinds of sectors for us. Um, we know that working with us as well and working with our participants is that inclusive and that CSR element as well. And that we've got the reach, the local and regional and national coverage. And, you know, I've put in here that you'll have a single point of contact. If you want to go to the next page, sorry. I've mentioned here about the contracts that we do work on and the employees that we've been supporting so far. And I'm sure there's others, another one called Daniel Waite as well, or somebody, I can't remember the name, full name. But um, these, these employees that we're working with at this moment in time and moving forward, I'm not going to say it here today and say we have hundreds of people ready to go into the sector. That's not the case at all. Um, there is that way of breaking down those myths and perceptions, which people, they don't understand what the sector is about. And this is where your input is so invaluable to us, being available there to talk about what happens in your sector, being able to feed back that information. Cause you know, I speak to somebody at HS2, I might speak to a line at that level, um, at a high level, but it's that information about our participants being filtered down. So when they come on site, oh, he's got no experience, don't know what to do with him. 
Um, and that happens quite a lot. So that's the kind of thing that I'd love to have those kind of conversations with you about. The other thing is that we spoke about apprenticeships. Um, the struggle we have is that our programs, we don't have many young people on the programs from 19 um, to 24 year age. They start usually about coming in about 28. They've already got their, um, their expenses, their living expenses. So to go onto an apprenticeship salary at that age is also a barrier for them. Um, and really, I just want to discuss that with you basically. Naz, do you have any other questions before we move on? No, I don't know. Sorry, I was just, um, I know. Um, so we, my mute button has given me a bit of a problem. Um, Jenny, I just had one question really oh, for they? you. Um, it's with regards to sort of, um, obviously you talked Coconut about, some, sorry, um, can you hear me? Is that yeah. all right? Sorry, sorry. Um, I just, obviously you talked about some of the work that you were doing at the moment uh, at Ingeus. Um, and how would you say sort of in a little bit more detail that you're working with employers to overcome some of the recruitment challenges that we have in the sector? So, and, you know, we do a number of things such as we um, create employer routeways based on the criteria of what the employer is looking for in terms of, um, uh, for example, if it is a construction and a labourer role, we would hold a sector-based work academy um, with a guarantee and we will fund for the CSES at the end of that and then we would hope that the employer at the end of that would actually interview those candidates and then have them into, um, into work and I think that's the crucial point is having the employer's involvement throughout the whole process at the beginning and at the end and then the interview and it, I think it's that element which grabs the attention and the buy-in from the participant, knowing that the employer is also invested into the invested into the course, and knowing who they touch, you know, the person they're going to meet, what the environment is going to look like, what the hours of work, why is it an early start? You know, it's it's cold. You know, we winter times is not great for a lot of people. Setting that scene, you know, but also working in hot weather is no so can't be great as well. You know. Um, what kind of career developments are available um, for an individual moving up the rank, you know, become um, different types of qualifications. But this is where the employer, large or small, it, their, their input is so, so crucial to get that person on board and to get them sustained because that's the element. Because, you know, I'm, and apologies with any agencies on board at this moment in time. My feelings with when someone signs up with an agency, they don't get that type of same kind of commitment. But working with established companies, whether it's SMEs or large organizations, they've got that career path. But with agencies, they move them from site to site and no work one day, zero, you know, et cetera, et cetera. No, thank you. Um, that's really, really helpful. Um, I think now we're going to break, uh, go into breakout rooms um, where we can sort of feedback and uh, maybe discuss, um, you know, our thoughts on some of the points that have been raised. Um, Amanda, are you happy to do that for us? Should we just set a time on that? Um, yeah. Just looking at looking at where we've got to on the agenda. Um, yeah. So we've yeah. got. How long did you want to allow for that? Well, so we're, we're actually on time. So we've probably got a good 20, 25 minutes to have some discussion before we feedback. OK, so shall we say 20 minutes? Is that OK? And then, yeah. you know, we can uh, come back if that's OK. Um, okay. Amanda, okay. if you're happy to do that for us, that would yeah. be great. Thank that's you. Absolutely. Back at 25 past, yeah? Yeah, that's yeah. fine. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Jenny. Thanks, Andy. Thank you. Sorry, <laughs> I was talking there, then I was Sorry, just you <laughs> No, no, it's fine. But yeah, okay, hopefully... hopefully <laughs> hopefully you've gathered what I was talking about thank you Thanks. there's never enough time in these breakout sessions yeah um, we were saying that we 20 minutes seemed like a long time but we certainly we certainly could have had another time but we can we can do a little bit now I suppose and, and do the feedback <clears throat> right so um yeah, I d shall, I, shall I go first, Joe? You can. Have you gone into witness protection, Gemma? Suddenly you're all... Uh... <laughs> oh, I've gone dark. Sorry. I've, uh, I don't know if I can do anything about it. Right. <laughs> um, yeah, so it, it's quite interesting. We, um, 
we're talking about some of the themes within our group and although we kind of you know, at the end actually we were talking about something that fed on for what Andy was saying around that kind of the supply chain element and actually feeding into the SMEs and how we kind of need to get better at doing that um, but one of the things that we actually focused on was although there is challenges around getting people into the sector through kind of like that information advice and guidance they're perhaps getting at school actually the problems can be run a lot deeper than that and actually it's not necessarily just about the advice they're getting typically people going into the sector can be that little bit older and with that comes it challenges because it restricts kind of funding that's available for the types of learning they can do if it sits outside of an apprenticeship um but also you know we spoke jenny spoke about pay we spoke about that actually um if we've got everyone here sophie was talking about how you know in their organization they they pay national living wage that isn't a challenge but actually a challenge is you know, people seeing the career progression within the sector, if they're kind of capped at level two, you know, what does what does a career look like within the sector and how do we, you know, perhaps as as, as providers, employers, awarding organisations work around to show to people going into the industry what a career can look like if it sits outside of going into a management kind of route and you want to stay within your kind of technical skills. And actually, that's probably a bigger challenge than just the simple advice they're getting to get into the sector or the, the kind of that initial recruitment stage. And the, the other thing that we spoke about, and you know, this won't be probably a shock to a kind of a lot of us on the call is, you know, when we start thinking about things like T-levels is actually making things like the work placements workable and actually making a T-level be um, a route that actually helps people into employment in terms of getting them on those work placements because the work placement for a lot of employers it, it isn't that isn't that um, as much as they probably want to support the sector isn't always achievable for them because of resource because of you know the day to day what they've got to kind of commit to um, and how do we how do we overcome that and I think that isn't a new barrier I think that's something we've been talking about for a long time but we still seem to kind of be there. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Gemma. Shall I cover a few things that we talked about in our group and then yeah. anybody that didn't get a chance to speak can, can add some stuff as well. I think a lot, a lot of the talk in, in our group was, was around apprenticeships specifically. We had, we, we had employers in the group that were active in apprenticeships, um, both big and small. Um, there was talk about how the standards um, were not fit for purpose in some areas and, you know, these are being addressed with IFATE and particularly talking about how the BRICS standard uh, needs to be broken down um, a, a bit more and, and, and under review. Um, there was some talk about how the um, levy, there's a, um, a desire for the levy to be broadened um, to a training levy rather than um, strictly an apprenticeship levy. And so it can be used for, for more things um, because the supply chain in some cases is finding apprenticeships too, too challenging and too complex um, so they're disengaging from from that and need a lot of support with that we did talk about the future um about timber frames and air source heat pumps and the the, the and as the shortage of air source heat pump installers and particularly big shortages within the plumbing sector um and the need to support that sector as as, as the whole construction sector and, and the good practice that we've maybe maybe demonstrated in some areas to be focused in on those areas where we're going to see these massive shortages um for new homes um there was some frustration about um using um colleges and some of the entry requirements that um, colleges seem to be imposing um which seem to be um preventing some people from getting into courses and apprenticeships particularly around maths and English and unwillingness to take people on that don't already carry certain qualifications um, it, from numerous colleges, um, uh, seemingly, um, even though with an apprenticeship, there isn't um, a, a set entry requirement. Obviously, some training providers are imposing those and that's that's restrictive for for the industry. Um, yeah, so there's just a lot of talk about how how kind of there's a need for that review of standards, um, but collab throughout talk about um, how collaboration, sharing good practice. I do think that this could be the start of some of, of, of us working together more. Um, obviously, we've got Naz, um, who is a great kind of 
central point for the construction industry within City and Guilds to, to, to kind of help to bring these things together and bring in other colleagues. Um, we've got a little bit more time. If anybody didn't have a chance to, to speak or if anything else to add, should we just kind of throw the, uh, throw the floor open a little bit? What I was going to say, and I'm going to be a little bit um, controversial, sorry, Joe. Um, I what I wanted to ask in our group, and maybe this would be a really good point to just I'm just going to throw it in as a starting point. Um, to, to have, what are everybody's opinions on with regards to the CIT being more responsible for driving um, a lot of the training requirements uh, forward, and are they overseeing this? You know, what do what do people think? Um, because I know as soon as you mentioned CITB, there's so many different opinions and so many different thoughts on that. So I'll throw that out there um, and maybe that can start us all off. Perhaps too controversial now. <laughs> I think just very briefly, having worked for CIGB um, for many years, I can trust me, I can feel the pain being a, now working for a company directly. Um, they can be challenging. And I think, yes, they most definitely need to push it a lot more. Um, they could do a lot. Obviously, I know they pulled out from apprenticeships because that was my role. And I, I was um, on, on, on the books of being made redundant. Um, yet they're still offering apprenticeships in different areas, but they're not very clear. And absolutely, they need to push it a lot more. I think for a levy board, who who they are, being an industry training board, they, they they need to be a lot more involved. For example, where are they on things like this today? Um, and many other events I've been to, they, there's never a sign sign of them. And to be honest with you, the, the contact now is 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 quiet. I'm in a fortunate position because having worked for them, I know who to go to to a point. But even that is now becoming even more challenging. Um, so yeah, that's. I say it's a very controversial subject, so I won't I won't go on too much. Otherwise, I'll be, you'll all be here till five o'clock. <laughs> um, and we, I, Alan, we would support house builders would support what you've just said, and, and we didn't support CITB in the consensus vote, but it got carried through. What we're now doing is trying to work with them to explain to them the the day to day challenges that we face and trying to refocus them. I think that's where the that's where the value lies. You know, we're all stuck with paying the 035 percent levy. Um, so what we need to do is work with them to actually get them supporting us in the areas where we feel we need support, which might be on things like occupational traineeships, might be on collaborative projects and might be extending the attendance grant and achievement grant and short course duration grants, the variety of grants to different types of training programmes so that we can train as many people as possible to upskill the workforce. Um, they've got quite a narrow remit and like to do what they like to do, but sometimes that doesn't always deliver value to their customer base and, and they need to they didn't need to know that. So that's what yeah. we're um, talking to Tim Balkan about. Yeah, no, absolutely. As I say, I know the uh, the levies, it, it can be so challenging to do anything. You know, you're paying that levy, but they're, they're trying to get grants out of them. Everything's very complicated. Again, having worked with a lot of them, and I, I moved from an AO role, an apprenticeship role, to an advisor role for a brief time. And at that time, I, I couldn't understand it. And I've been working for 12 years, and I thought, really, like, they've got to. And all I said at every meeting was, you've got to learn to simplify it because people won't use you. Um, they make it very, very challenging. But I think it's like, we, we need to work with them. They're not going to go away. So we've just got to try to build the best relationship we can with them. <laughs> The, the scary thing, so we're not, we're not a levy player, we're, we're into supply side of things, but we talk to our customers all the time. And the scary thing that we hear from our customers, for the, for the people who pay the construction levy, then they consider CITB to be challenging because of the complexity and the, the difficulty of knowing what to access and how to access. But the, 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 the non-construction levy payers don't even consider them. You know, so they're not even thought of as a place to go to get training. They're not even on the list of, of, of where you go. And that, that almost feels quite scary when you think of the old skills council type of thinking, that they should be the place for everybody, whether you're a levy player or not, should almost be irrelevant in that thinking process. But our SMEs, just, they're just not on the list. And, and, and that, to me, speaks volumes. And, and also, I, I, that's kind of what I was going to say, that they're not representative fully. They only represent in-scope construction firms. There are lots of non-traditional construction companies out there that are going to be really affected by, like, the um, upgrade of existing homes for net zero, like thinking about the great estates that are going to have to reach EPC target C to rent out their, 
you know, the 17th century properties and things like that. They have building teams that will be doing this stuff and they're just not on CITB's list. And the cathedrals as well, they've got big estates in city centres. Like all of that, they just don't represent any of those employers. And you almost get in that world of complexity that the government see the CITB as the people to speak to about the sector, but they represent a part of the sector, but they certainly don't represent the whole sector in any shape or form. And so yeah. there's a bit of a confused voice out there at times. Massively, yeah, massively. Yep. Sorry, Joe, you opened up a, a worm. You opened up a can of worms on that one. But yeah. Indeed, no. It's, um, that's why we're here. <laughs> Would anybody else like to um, raise anything on the, on the topic generally about um, how we prepare for the future? I think maybe just lowering the entries and making it. And I, I think um, Lynette and Andy made a major point right at the beginning about just maybe having a pre-standard level, I don't know, for something where we can introduce people in, you know, and maybe, uh, I, I don't know, I need to look into it a lot more. Mm -hmm. uh, I think something where we can actually get the people in so they've not, they're not going to be put off by entry requirements. Um, and again, maybe having, I don't know, I don't know. It's a lot, a lot to think about, a lot to think about, but I just mm -hmm. think we've, we've got to try to help people, you know, schools mm -hmm. and colleges will constantly tell young people, <laughs> you haven't got the qualifications going to construction. Mm. Go on a multi skills course. Alan is a, a Alan is a precursor, pre recruitment. We we've been looking at and we've used it. The uh, old NVQ level one intro into construction. There's yeah. also a level one intro into health and safety in the um, site environment. I think it's called it's something like that. Yeah. And if you yeah. do those two short sharp courses, you can also get an entry level CSCS card. Yeah, that's we're doing quite a, a good load. taster. That's quite a good introduction yeah. for somebody who's considering construction. They're not quite sure which route to take. It gives them enough. And also what it does, if you try and put them into a site environment, let's say on an apprenticeship programme, they've got a little bit of now. So your site managers aren't taking somebody who's completely green. They've got a little bit of now about how a site works, health and safety yeah, protocols yeah, on the site. Yeah. They understand what construction is about. So you can feed them in after they've done the level one onto a level two, level three program, and they're not gonna be like a fish out of water. It's one step better than taking somebody completely green off the street. Um, so we're looking at that as a sort of entry, pre-entry program. Mm. Yeah, it could be a good idea, couldn't it? Yeah. yeah. It could work. yeah. I yeah. feel really, I said this in my breakout group, but I feel really strongly as well that construction trades themselves need to be more aspirational. So we know that the majority of the sector is self-employed or a massive proportion of it is. Those individuals, they might only have a carpentry, which now would be capped at level two. That is not appropriate in my mind. You know, we need to have higher level trade standards like they have in other parts of um, Europe. And that will, that will that, there's research out there that suggests that that might raise pay, for example. Um, and it's, it, it, there are barriers to joining the sector, and but one, um, they're very practical barriers. A lot of them are pragmatic, but a lot of the time it is just that people can't see. I could be a master carpenter because all you can do is get to level two, and it's the equivalent of a poor GCSE, and that just isn't good enough. I agree. Just picking up as well on the fact of like the level one MBQ, etc. From a provider's perspective, what sort of funding does that bring in? Is that then classified as a full-time course? Because then for me, that becomes restrictive that I can't put learners on that as well. So if I can get funded for 575 hours for it, then I'd more than happily do that process. But at the moment, I can't, and I have to package other things together. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, we've got to work within the boundary, the, 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 the funding and policy boundaries. And obviously, a, a lot of the stuff about the standards the, the standards are written by employers and so the whole idea of the standards that they they were fit for purpose and represented the sector but i think one of the big drawbacks is that it's it's who's around that table and 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 it's such a in, in such a complex sector how, how can one standard fit the needs of, of of you know all of you guys on on the call it sounded like lynette you're you're talking to i say so you've got a seat around the table there to, to yeah make it is difficult though it is difficult because you're right they had different sorts of people at the trailblazing groups and when you try to split a standard if it's a brickwork standard for the whole of construction house builders going off and saying well we want to tailor it to house building you get immediate pushback from all the other which we which we get so mm -hmm. is the answer to have a brickwork house building one and then i fate will say no because you can only have one role which is a bricklayer so then what do you call it so there's a lot of red tape around 
how they've set up the accreditation of standards and what we're trying to do is work with IFAPE and say we get all of that and we know it's linked to funding but in the real world what skills do we actually need pull it back to the skill shortage yeah. you know construction need their set of skills but we need our set of skills um and it, and the, the the answer might lie in pathways and optional modules because there's a certain amount that is core to both general construction brickwork and house building brickwork but then you might go off on a house building pathway and a civils pathway or whatever so it, it, it's it's very difficult to actually try and affect change but we've got to keep trying because we've been through one year of hell mm. and the dropout rate is high and the attraction rate is low people don't want to do them so what's the point of having a standard that's not working yeah thank you Maria. yeah and i think you know is there in terms of is there anything we can be doing more as like an awarding organization epao is there anything more we can be doing you know this is the first we've ran of these kind of round tables for construction i know that we've obviously for a long time done a lot of our webinar series and things and it's been a long time since we've all been able to do something face to face um so i think we're just conscious you know what's the best mechanism does this work as a mechanism to get conversation going? Are there things that we could be doing differently? Um, you know, how can we support making sure that at least we understand and we're bringing together people from the industry so you're sharing kind of the challenges you're all having? Um, what are people's thoughts on that kind of moving forward? As I started for Tet, oh, sorry. Sorry, Steve, you go first. No, oh, thank you. Um, I, I was going to say it would be good to have some kind of consensus really about how long it takes to become really good at your skill and your craft, because I think that in, in the last kind of over, over decades, the, the length of time it takes to, um, to learn a trade to whatever level, what the standard at the time has got shorter and shorter and shorter. And I'm not sure exactly why that is, but I, I think it's probably to do with short termism and stuff. Um, but actually, if people are leaving with less skills, um, and but they're being you know but that 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 level has a currency that probably isn't helpful for like the sustainability of industry so kind of some kind of consensus on how lot because you know lots of people think it takes five years if you talk to a really skilled bricklayer or a really skilled carpenter joiner they're like oh yeah you, you know you're not really skilled for five years so that I think a piece, like a piece of research that really said the time it takes that would be so useful oh yeah Sophie, I was going to say we endorse our head of production would endorse what you've just said. It, it takes about four to five years to be competent at a trade, which is why we've got to think carefully about how much of the learning needs to be theoretical and in college and how much of it is time served out on site. I think where City and Guilds, picking up on the, the request earlier from Gemma, where City and Guilds can help out is we've been through a cycle of assessment this year on the standards. And I know you've got the <coughs> LEAPA reports that are coming out shortly. Um, you will have experienced issues in assessing the current crop of students that have just gone through the program. I think it'd be really useful for you guys as EPAOs to feed back, well, you know, the employing organizations and the training organizations they train people we got to the end of the process we had to assess them and here are some of the challenges that we had to work on so in our organization you know the two-day assessment was fraught with issues you know we had to support quite heavily um and so did barrett um people doing their knowledge their practical skills building their portfolio going through the professional discussion it's quite a rigorous process and it's very off-putting so we need to have a look at you know what went well and where is there room for improvement and where would we want to suggest change and I think your LEPA reports will have an awful lot of insight into that. Thank you. Naz? Oh, yeah, sorry, no, sorry, you me. sorry. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. And um, Lynette, and I'm really conscious now we're coming to the end here. Um, but yeah, um, with regards to the EPA, we do um, feedback and, and do sort of a regular reporting, but it is something that obviously we do take on board and, and thank you for the comment, it's really helpful. Um, that just leaves me to um, close the discussion today. Um, I wanted to thank uh, all our, both our panellists for their time 
um, and obviously uh, their insight. Obviously, thank you to all of you for participating um, and adding to this discussion. And as Gemma says, I think it would be really helpful um, if you could feed back to either myself, Gemma or Joe, um, any other thoughts or comments that you wanted to add to this discussion. And obviously your thoughts on how we take this forward, because obviously we feel that's been really, really successful um, in hearing what you've got to say, because it really does help us shape on what we're doing and obviously what we do with regards to the construction portfolio going forward. Um, the recording, uh, it will be available, so do let us know uh, and we can send that on to you. Um, and that just leaves me to say, have a, a great Friday and a fabulous weekend, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Bye -bye.